Good morning. Stand with me, please. And let's go to the Lord in worship. Father, we worship you today. We lift you up and we thank you for your great faithfulness. We thank you for your unfailing love. We thank you, Lord, for your never-ending mercy. Oh, Lord, were we to count all of our blessings, we would never be able to enumerate them all in the course of an entire lifetime. For, Father, you have been good to us. You have been faithful to us. You have been kind toward us, Lord. Never have you treated us as our sins deserved, but you were gracious toward us. And Lord, you were loving, and Lord, you were diligent in your pursuit of us. And we worship you today. We bless your name, and we lift you up, and we say, thank you, Lord God, for all that you are and for all that you have done. We bless your name, and we give you praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' most sacred, most holy, most beautiful name. And all the Lord's people who agreed said together, amen and amen. The Lord bless you. You may be seated in the name of Christ. Hallelujah. I... Good morning. I come down here today because I want to do a couple things. Um, we are privileged, are we not, to be children of God? Are we not privileged to be blessed of the Lord? <laughs> I just, <laughs> the Lord, the Lord has really been convicting me lately about a lot of things, so I must be way off, but nevertheless, I'm, I, I, I'm working on it, and um, we've been talking about our partnership in the gospel, and in Philippians 1, 3 through 6, this has been our our, our text, it's based upon uh, what Jesus had told the disciples in John 20, that as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. And then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And then in Philippians chapter 1, verse 3, and these are in your notes on the back of your bulletin, if you want to look there. Um, I want to I enumerate something for you today that I, I really want you to behold. He said, Paul is praying and he says, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And so one of the things that we've been talking about in laying philosophical foundation for ministry is that we exist to do the ministry of Christ. And we exist to do the ministry of Christ in his love, for his glory, and by his power. And so everything that we do must be for his sake, for his honor, for his glory. The great promise of Jesus in your notes is that he would build the church. On this rock, he said, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. He said in John chapter 15, you did not choose me, I chose you. In Matthew 20, 28, he said, he did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So in the fact that Jesus is the designer, the architect, the builder, and the sustainer, and the one who finishes the project called the church, he's, he's everything. He's the cornerstone, and he's the capstone. He's the alpha, he's the omega. He's the A and the Z, the beginning and the end. He's everything. Okay. So whenever you or I take ownership of something that doesn't belong to us, that's called thievery. Right? I mean, I'm not all that smart, but I figured that much out. Okay. Whenever you or I take ownership of something that does not belong to us, that's called thievery. The church does not belong to you. You do not belong to you. So when you take ownership of your life, it's thievery. Because you are no longer your own. You have been bought with a price. You belong to Jesus. When you and I take ownership of the church, 
Well, I this, and we that, and me this, and this is my ministry, and this is my little kingdom, and this is my little territory. It's thievery. It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to Jesus. It's his work. He could reassign me tomorrow. You know why? It's his task. My dad was in the military 20 years. A GI is government issue. As back in the days, and some of you vets will know, where you could, you could get in trouble if you cut yourself shaving because you're damaging government property. You went where you were told, when you were told, for whatever reason your superiors had. It mattered not what you had planned because you were not your own anymore. You were Uncle Sam's for that period of time. You're not your own. You belong to Jesus. I belong to Jesus. We belong to Jesus. So he has to be the one who lays out for us how our individual life and our corporate life are to function. He does it, he does it in the scripture. We've been talking about this. And so that's why I'm going quickly through here. He, he gave us a great commandment, number two in your notes, and a great commission. These lay out for him, the, the, or for us, rather, the broad vision of Jesus. The great commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is love your neighbor as yourself. This is the great commandment. And then the great commission is in Matthew 28, Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teach them to observe the things that I have commanded you, and most assuredly, I'm with you always to the very end of the age. So these things that the Lord has laid out for us is the universal vision of Jesus for his church. It's his design. It's his design. Now, my, my, my parents are preparing to move back to California, so pray for that, please, and uh, pray the Lord's will and the Lord's provision and all of that stuff. So, so for the first time in a long time, I'm, I'm looking at houses. <laughs> Have you noticed that every house almost is different? Even track houses are different. But they all have a functionality. Most houses have a kitchen. Most houses have a bedroom. Most houses have bathrooms. Most houses have, you know, a living room or a den or something, something like that. Because that's kind of what a house is, right? It's a space to dwell. It's a space to sleep. It's a space to eat. That's what a house is, okay? But yet there are there's many different kinds of houses as there are people. Okay, but the basics are still the same. So when we get down to our mission, there's unique missions. Some, some, some churches, like some houses, serve a particular purpose and a particular need. Others, like other houses, do, do something a little differently, maybe less extravagant or more extravagant. It all depends upon the functionality and the need of the designer. But they're all kind of basically the same. The houses that uh, on, on the hills above mine, they've got bedrooms, they've got bathrooms, they've got kitchen. The house next door to mine has bedroom, bathroom, kitchen. They all, they all have these five elements, or these basic elements, rather. But yet each one's different because there's a particular purpose to the designer. That's what I'm trying to say when I tell you the difference between vision and mission. There are things that every house has. There are things that every church must have. But then depending upon who the designer wants the church to reach and how the designer wants the church to reach them, that's what will define the scope of the mission. Okay? So every church must worship. To love the Lord your God with all your heart is to worship. Every church must do ministry. To love your neighbor as yourself is to do ministry. Every church 
must do evangelism. To go is to go. Costa Dere said, when I received the Holy Ghost, I got the Holy Go. Evangelism isn't to be left to, oh, the Salvation Army, they do that really good. Or, oh, Victory Outreach, they do that really good. No, evangelism is every church. Every church must incorporate the body of Christ into fellowship. Every church must bring us together into fellowship, incorporation into fellowship. That's letter D in your notes. Because that's what baptism is. It's not just the public act. It's not just a symbolic act. It's bringing from outside in. Lost to found. Dead to live. Not a brother to a brother. Not a sister to a sister. That's what baptism is. And then every church has to train in discipleship. Every church has to do these things of teaching to observe whatsoever things the Lord has taught us. Those are five things. Next Sunday, I'm going to start talking to you about our mission, the cathedral's mission, the patent community's mission, what that looks like. But as I navigate through this and, and what, I, what I have in my heart that the Lord has put upon me, I'm, I'm reminded as I was last Sunday that we, we must not and cannot look at worship as an appendage or as a way of preparing you, warming up the crowd for what I'm going to say. Our lives are designed to be filled with awe of God. When I lose my sense of wonder, when I lose my sense of awe, when I lose my sense of the glory of the Lord, I'm losing perspective then. Here's what happens. The minute my worship begins to diminish, my sense of self begins to increase. Let's think about some of the terminology we use. Give him all the glory. Give him praise. Give him honor. Lift up his holy name. Why do we use that language? It's because at the end of the day or whatever, whatever colloquialism you'd like to me to, to state to understand, the bottom line, the end of the day, the final analysis, here's what worship is. Worship is the acknowledgement that he is the owner and you are not. He is the Lord, and you are not. He is the King, and you are not. It is the great defense against my own tendency to be a thief. Worship keeps me from stealing from Him. Worship keeps me from taking my life because it's not mine. Worship keeps me from taking the ministry because it's not mine. Worship keeps me from taking the church because it's not mine. The more worship becomes part of my life, the less of my life there is, and the more of his. John 3.30, not in your notes, not on the screen, write it down. John the Baptist, dealing with a circumstance and a situation in which the ministry was going great guns for him, and suddenly it wasn't. In fact, people came up to him and said, you know that guy you baptized? Yeah, that Jesus guy? The one who came to you and you baptized him? Well, now everybody's going to him. And John almost, I, in my mind, I almost see a little, but I'm sarcastic, so I, I have to fight that. You know, you know, John's like, well, of course. <laughs> it's how it's supposed to be. You didn't hear anything I said, huh? 
But here's what he said in John 3.30. He must increase. I must decrease. That little verse is the crux of worship. He must increase. I must decrease. Not an option, not a nice little thing, not a noble thing on me. Oh, what a selfless person John is. No, you don't understand. This is the only way. So worship is the gift of God to keep you from being a thief. It is the gift of God to teach you what heaven is truly like. It is a part of heaven that comes to the earth. It is where you get to join with the saints in heaven and declare the wonders of God. It's the part of heaven you don't have to wait for. It's the part of the glory of the kingdom of God coming near. It is the rule and reign of God coming into your life. It keeps the flesh at bay. It keeps the enemy scattered. It keeps the mind pure. And it keeps the heart tinder hallelujah what a gift from God to worship him to worship him because only then can ministry flow look at letter B again in your notes to love your neighbor as yourself is ministry ministry I asked Reverend to stay close here because I, I, I want to I want to pray for you before we go any further in the notes today and I mean really actually pray for you take a few minutes and pray for you so forgive me in house I got to do a little bit of instruction because I didn't I didn't tell the guys before service because I wasn't sure I was going to do this but when we're going to pray for some people but I don't want the cameras going to the people at all. So just keep the cameras on, uh, on, on, the, on, on Brother Jesse as we just worship the Lord in a few minutes, okay? Um, because I want you in the house to feel the freedom to respond and, and receive prayer, okay? But let me talk to you for a few minutes about what ministry is, okay? James chapter 5. It's not in your notes, but I want you to turn there if you, if you got it, if you got time. If you don't, it's okay. But James chapter 5. Verse 13, I'm reading from the NIV 84 translation. But he says, is, is, is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he sinned, he'll be forgiven. Therefore, in light of this, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Now, one of the great tragedies, again, is when we don't do A, worship, and make sure that that thief tendency within my own flesh is removed. What tends to happen is then we start taking ownership of this, of, of ministry. And then we, 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 we pray. Now, now listen to me carefully. We pray and we look for each other and we try to help each other. But again, as I shared with you last Sunday, if I haven't worshipped, what, what tends to be done then is it's a favor. Now I'm serving because of what I might get. I'm keeping track. I'm keeping record. Or even worse, and this is the really scary part for me. Let's say I pray for my brother Lewis here. Since I can't pick on Jesse today, he's behind the piano. <laughs> Let's say I pray and the Lord does a miracle in his life. You know what the natural flesh tendency is? To thank me. You know what the natural flesh tendency for me is? Whew. 
Now, we're smart enough to deny it. But that little rascal worms his way into our lives. Amen? To God be the glory. To God be the honor. To God be the praise. He can make a donkey talk. He gave a donkey a word of knowledge. He can use me. <laughs> it doesn't make me a whole lot more than Balaam's donkey, all right? Amen? The glory belongs to the Lord. The honor belongs to the Lord. The praise belongs to the Lord because only the Lord can do the work. Now he chooses to use us. Let him call for the elders of the church. Let him lay hands. Anoint with oil. We have oil in here. Now what is oil in the scripture? Oil represents the Holy Spirit. Okay? So visible speaking of invisible. Physical speaking of supernatural. So why do we anoint with oil? Why do we call for elders? Elders are shepherds. That's what the term means. Okay, elding. Pa pastors are shepherds. We eld, we lead. John Wimber used to say, if you want to know who your elders are, look for the people that are elding. Okay, it's not a title. It's not just a board. It's people who are willing to serve. Instead of doing this, they're doing this. Instead of this, it's this. They're willing to serve. So they represent the Lord. Physical representation. Amen? Oil represents the Holy Spirit. So when we anoint, which means basically to touch, when we touch with oil, we're saying, Lord, as we're doing this, would you do this? As we're touching with our physical hand, would you touch with your supernatural hand? As we're touching with physical oil, would you please pour out the Holy Spirit and touch this person's life? Acts records for us that Christ did amazing miracles through the Apostle Paul. In fact, what Luke says is they were extraordinary miracles. That's opposed to your daily ordinary miracle, apparently. <laughs> These were extraordinary miracles, so much so that he would even anoint with oil, anoint and pray over cloths, and people would take those cloths and lay hands, or lay the cloth on the sick person, and the sick person be healed. That struck Luke as extraordinary in Ephesus. Now, here's where your pastor's under great conviction. There should be bread in the house of the Lord. There should be oil in the house of the Lord. People should be able to come into the house of the Lord and receive prayer. And you can. I mean, you, I, I stay afterwards and pray and, all, and with people. But we really need the Lord to do some things. We really need the Lord to do some things. How many of you are facing something today that you can't see your way through unless the Lord does something? We need the Lord. How many of you are sick today? You need a touch from God today. You need someone to anoint you with oil. Just because this is what the book says. Amen? We really need the Lord to do some things. Now, when I came into prayer service this morning, I was struck by how desperately we need the Lord. I was even convicted by it. It's an even, even more accurate term. And I look, I know the difference between being convicted and having a thought. I don't know that much more, but, but I know the difference. We desperately need the Lord. So what I want us to do for, I don't know, five minutes or so, 
We'll see how the Lord wants to go from there. But I asked Brother Jesse if he would lead us in a simple course. It's an old course, so most of you know it, and I chose that intentionally. But it speaks of the breath of God. Our text from all of last year was that he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. The word inspiration means to breathe in. We need the Lord. We need to breathe in the Lord. But also, you that are sick, and you say, I need the Lord to heal me. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet, right where you are, and I'm going to have some of the pastors in the church come by and lay hands on you and anoint you with oil. Just quickly, quietly. We don't, it doesn't need to be any large-scale, sightful thing. Because that's not what he said. He just said, let them anoint with oil. So that's what we're going to do. Okay? And the rest of us, would you just worship? Would you just worship? And let's call upon the name of the Lord. So you that are standing, you're asking for prayer. And I want you to know that. You that are standing, you're asking for prayer. Okay? Hallelujah. Jesse, just lead us. Hallelujah. We're thankful, Father, that we can come into your presence and know joy and know peace. And know, Lord God, that you hear and you answer our prayers. Father, we as a congregation, we pray now for our friends and our family, those who stood for healing. Lord, as you have touched and as you have anointed, we pray, Lord God, that you would stretch forth your mighty hand and release your mighty spirit into their lives. Heal those who are sick. Strengthen their bodies. Strengthen their minds. Strengthen them emotionally. Touch their families, Lord God. Pour out your mighty, precious Holy Spirit. And we thank you, Lord, for the privilege we have of doing your work, of participating in your kingdom's ministry. We bless you, we honor you, we worship you now. In Jesus' most precious name. And all who agreed said together, Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. Jesse, thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Before we end our time together now this morning, I, I want to I wanna speak to you about letter C in your notes, evangelism a little bit. And its importance. Um, one of the, the odd psychological twist that happens with humanity is once something becomes mildly institutionalized or completely institutionalized, whatever your perspective, the tendency is to remove the individual responsibility within that organization. Uh, we even talk about it in, in business, the corporate veil, you know, and it's like, well, you know, it's uh, you know, you can't pierce the veil. There's, you know, they're not personally liable. All, all those kinds of things. And until you start really getting into the, the, the brass tacks of the law, and particularly those in a nonprofit setting, you have fiduciary responsibility, and you're, you're super responsible, whether you believe it or not, or understood it or not. But we have a tendency to use the, the, the term they. You know, well, they always. Are they this, or the system that, or the government this, or the people that, or the church this? And so we have a tendency to leave evangelism to the, to the evangelists. And we don't understand our own personal responsibility. All five of these vision things are things that all of us are responsible to participate in. Every human being that loves Jesus Christ must worship. Whether you are a singer or a musician is irrelevant. Every human being that loves Jesus Christ must serve, must minister. Can't leave it to somebody else. Every human being that loves Jesus Christ must share the gospel and influence the lost. So under evangelism, somewhere in your notes, I want you to write that phrase. Sharing the gospel and influencing the lost. This is our task. 
This is our task. We feel challenged at work. We feel challenged in school. We feel challenged in places because we're around so many unbelievers. And, and, and many in, in, in today's day and age, they mock our faith and they ridicule us and all sorts of things of that nature. And, and we, we, we almost want the Lord to deliver us from the bondage of being around lost people. When we don't understand, that's exact, we're exactly where the Lord wants us to be. Around lost people. Sharing the gospel and influencing the lost. Don't run from the challenge, embrace it. Don't run from the difficulty. Uh, it, it, not only accept it, but, but, but be excited about it. The Lord has placed you because he trusts you to be in a position where you have contact daily with people who don't know him. He's trusting you. He's trusting you, A, to know the gospel of which you believe, know what it means, prepare yourself, study to show yourself approved. As Peter said, be prepared to give a logical defense of the faith you hold. You need to have all that, that within your spirit, within your mind. But not only, but not only the, the, the sense of the gospel, but he's called you to be a, a Christian so that you would be an influencer. So men and women who are lost would see how you're different than they are. Not in some weird religious way, but when you go through the same trials and difficulties they do, you handle it differently. Because God has taught you how to handle it differently. If people of faith do not have hope, then they don't have faith. I'll say that again. If people of faith do not have hope, then they do not have faith. My hope is in the resurrection. My faith is in that Jesus rose. So I have hope for my resurrection because I have faith in his resurrection. I have hope for my tomorrow because I have faith in what he did yesterday. My hope and my faith are intertwined. So when I become a person who understands the gospel and what its meanings are, then I can be a person of influence among those who are lost. Now, the reason this is so important, and I, there's, I mean, there's, there's a lot of reasons. One is the honor and the glory of the Lord. But, but even more importantly, well, not more importantly, but, but more to, to the point today, I don't think we understand how important the human soul is to God. When I get to heaven, God willing and grace finding, I will still be able to worship him. I will still receive in some form or another ministry because even though my needs will have, have long been gone, I'm sustained for all eternity by the, by the Christ. I will still have fellowship. In fact, that's one, of the, that's one of the trading cards and hallmarks of heaven is our loved ones who are there and all of those things. I will have the mind of Christ, so I will learn and grow in a very real way. So of the, of the five things that Jesus instructed us, four will be done in heaven. Worship, ministry, training in a very real way in the sense of garnering the mind of Christ, and certainly fellowship. They will be done in heaven. Not this one. Not this one. This has a shelf life. And it's very limited. And if you're leaving it to the institution to do, then you haven't understood what it is. My friend, Valson Abraham, you've heard me speak of him before. His father passed away this week. And I would appreciate you remembering his family in prayer. But his father, Stephen Abraham's, the, the pastor Stephen Abraham's, the closest thing I've ever come to, to, to meeting an apostle in my own life. He's, he's that 
kind of person. Well, his father, my friend Valson's grandfather, began the Pentecostal movement in India. Okay? And he had a saying, north, south, east, west. Or how did he do it? No, north, south, west, east. That's how he did it. North, south, west, east. No supper without evangelism. No supper without evangelism. In other words, he would not wind up his day if he'd not shared Jesus with someone. That's the way you become a person of influence. He knew that the soul of humanity, the soul of a human being, was of such vital interest and vital importance to God that he would send his only begotten son. That God so loved the world that whoever would believe in Jesus would not perish but would have everlasting life. The, the value of a human soul cannot be overstated. I want you to look in your notes in, in 2 Peter 3. The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Beloved, what is the will of God for the lost? That they're not lost. Amen. This is his heart. This is his desire. We cannot overstate the value of a human soul. Psalm 139. How precious it is, Lord, to realize that you're thinking about me constantly. I can't even count how many times a day your thoughts turn toward me. And when I waken in the morning, you're still thinking of me. Matthew 9, 36. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Joel 2, 25. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust have eaten. We must reach the lost. We must minister to the needs of people here in our church in Fruitvale, in Oakland, in the Bay, in California, in the West Coast, in the United States, to the very ends of the earth. The Lord put us in the middle of brokenness. Yes. So we could be the hands and feet of Jesus. Hallelujah. Luke 19.10, the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Isaiah 59, the Redeemer will come to Jerusalem, says the Lord, to buy back those in Israel who have turned from their sins. And this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit will not leave them, and neither will these words I have given you. They will be on your lips and on the lips of your children and your children's children forever. Amen. I, the Lord, have spoken. The lost in our family the lost in our house, the lost in our extended family, the lost in our neighborhoods, the lost in our places of work, the lost in our community. These are for whom Jesus has died. Every time, my friend Frank Eichloy would say, every time a lost person comes to the Lord, Jesus is receiving the reward of his suffering. I'll say that again. Every time a lost person comes to the Lord, Jesus himself is receiving the reward of his suffering. Is there a greater gift? Is there a greater act of worship? Is there a greater honor of ministry than to influence the lost with the beauty of Jesus? He can't be the good news and walk around like the bad news. 
the Lord is calling you and I to look upon those who are broken and wounded and hurting with his eyes and with his heart. I'll end with this story. It's something that um, Floyd McClung Jr., he was the uh, president of Youth with a Mission, but Floyd McClung Sr., his dad, uh, was an old family friend. In fact, it was, it was uh, Pastor McClung who, who uh, married Rhonda's parents when they were young, and he was the one who dedicated Rhonda to the Lord. And so Floyd McClung Jr. went on to become international director of Youth with a Mission, YWAM. Some of you have heard of that organization and, and these things. So, so because he was an old family friend, uh, he came to preach in the Corona Church 100 years ago when I was pastoring there. And, uh, and we, were, we had just started. It was a very small building, very small church. Could have fit, fit everybody in the balcony up there. I mean, may, maybe even right here. Though. I mean, a very, very small congregation at the time. But he came and he began to preach and he, and he said several things and, 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 uh, uh, that, that, that touched my heart because, uh, in fact, he wrote a book called The Father Heart of God, which is one of the best little books you'll ever, you'll ever get if you, if, you, if, you wanna, if you wanna find a book that talks about God's heart. It's called The Father Heart of God by Floyd McClung Jr. But he was preaching and he told the true story of, of, of an estrangement that had taken place between a father and his son. And the boy's name was Paco. And this took place in Madrid, in, in Spain. And he talked about, again, the father's heart and the brokenness that comes when the lost are lost and the bitterness that sets in and, the, and, the, and the, almost the, the, the cavalier attitude that some will have when they're lost. We've seen it. You see it with your own children. You see it with sometimes with your grandchildren, I'm sure. There's almost a cavalier in, in, indifference because, because they're, they're miserable. <laughs> you know, they're, they're miserable. They're lost. They're broken. And you know what? There's, there are few things quite as, as, uh, as uncomfortable as being a lost, broken, miserable person under the conviction of the Holy Ghost. And so I'll tell people this sometimes. It'll get worse before it gets better. So you that are praying for some lost loved ones, some lost children, some lost grandchildren, don't give up. Well, Pastor, they're becoming even more rebellious. Yeah, they probably will. Remember, the revelation tells us that when Lucifer's thrown down, he's even filled with great fury because he knows his time is short. You know, when, when, when the enemy's losing, he fights even harder. That doesn't change the outcome. Okay? But Floyd McClung was telling this story, true story, and he said, he said, um, the father was so broken for his son. They had the estrangement, they had the falling out, the son had left, and, and he had no way of even contacting his boy. So he took out an ad in the paper, and it was a very simple ad. It simply said, Paco, all is forgiven. I love you. Meet me on such and such date in the town square. And let's start over, Dad. So a few days later, on, after the ad had ran and after the town square, or after and that day came and the father went to the town square. 800 Pacos. showed up because there's that much brokenness that much estrangement and that many young men just wanting their dad to say I love you all is forgiven let's start over our father is saying that to a whole world I love you all can be forgiven you can start over. But we're the newspaper. We're what gets in their hands. We don't save anybody. 
But we've got to tell everybody, our Father loves you. Our Father will restore you. Our Father will forgive you. Our Father is willing to start over your life. That's what evangelism is. You and I have been given the most beautiful gift in the world, the gift of Jesus Christ and the beauty of his gospel. Let's not hide it in our hearts alone. Let's share it. Let's share it. Well, they need to do this and they need to do that. Would you let God do his stuff? Do you think the newspaper editor went to the dad and said, well, do you really want to say this? Don't you want them to repay what they lost? And don't you want them to do that? No, that's not the editor's job. That's not the printer's job. It's not our job to tell people how to get it right with God. It's our job to tell people that God will get it right with them if they'll let him. Too many of us want to be the Holy Spirit. How many of you in this room are the Holy Ghost? How many of you are the Holy Ghost? You are. Not not you want. You are. Okay. So, let's go to point A today. If I do the work of the Holy Ghost, then what am I? I'm a thief. If I let the Holy Spirit work through me, then I'm a minister. Let's let him do his work. Share the gospel. Share the gospel. Share the gospel. Share the gospel. And be the gospel. Be the gospel. Be the gospel. Be the gospel. gospel. Let's stand.